Okay, are we ready to begin? Can you guys all hear me? Perfect. Good morning, everyone. I hope you are all healthy and doing well today. Today's webinar is Intro to Channel Theories for Treating Pain, Part 1 with Mark. Rec today's webinar is recorded and presented by Lotus Institute of Integrative Medicine. Here at eLotus, we have been hosting educational programs for over two decades, and we are proud to be your trusted source for premium CEU content. For, and we have over 300 speakers, 700 courses, and 300 hours of CEUs. A little housekeeping before we get started. Today's webinar will run from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. We'll have a one-hour lunch break. It's set for 1 to 2 p.m. Two breaks in the morning and two in the afternoon. Now, I know you guys are all waiting for the lecture notes. So I just got the PowerPoint uh, just a few moments ago, so I'm working on it. And I will let you guys know when that is ready and available for you to download. So it should be ready in just a few minutes after the class begins. And if you are looking at your Zoom meeting right now, which you are, break, if you are looking at me, to you can also chat with your attendees who are also attending today's webinar live. Please, please, please do this right now. Set the chat to all attendees, all panelists and attendees. By default, it's just set to all panelists. And when that happens, the, the chat is not seen by everyone. And so we want everyone to be part of the conversation. So be sure, again, just look at it right now. Um, set your chat to all panelists and attendees. And we thank you so much for doing that. The quiz for today's webinar will be available tomorrow. And I'll send an email when that is ready. We need to do that. <laughs> and then the video replay will be ready on Monday. And again, I'll send an email when that's ready too. This weekend, you are going to get a deep understanding of what channel theories mean and how it can complement your practice. We're not sure why this is use a useful style that's not taught in school, but only by Jeffrey Ewan. But luckily, we do have Mark here with us to enlighten us today. He will be going over the concepts, concepts and essential information for you to understand channel theories. And tomorrow he will share his go-to points for the most con commonly seen pain conditions in clinic. So be sure you are signed up for tomorrow's class. Today is the foundation where you will understand why it works. Tomorrow, it's the goodies. So you want to be there. Let's get started with today's webinar and welcome Mark. Today, we are lucky to have with us Mark Mastrandrea returning to teach channel theories. Previously, he's taught courses on Shang Hun Lin and Wen Bing, which were such big hits with his attendees that we invited him back to teach in another class this year. In fact, we invited him to our studio, <laughs> our seminar studio, and he's the first one to come back this year. So we're really excited to have him here. It's a lot of great excitement. If you're interested in watching Mark's previous courses, they are available from his bio page. And if you are a Gold Pass member, they're already free for you to access from your Gold Pass menu. Did you know that Mark is one of the top students of Jeffrey Ewan? He has a deep understanding of the classics and is able to apply the theories to practical approaches in the clinic in such an elegant manner. He is brimming with knowledge and is extremely generous with it. You're going to learn a lot today, so be sure you are ready to take some great notes. All right, are you guys ready? We're going to go ahead and welcome Mark. Let me go ahead and switch the PowerPoint here first. You can hear me? All right. Welcome today to this brief introduction to channel theory. It is not going to be severely in-depth because um, that takes years and years of study to do that. And uh, I mean, just going to school, you could consider at Swedish Institute where I went to school, where Jeffrey had a school, three years just for a general introduction, right? Of learning this like semesters at a time for each channel. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is we're going to do a very brief um, introduction to channel theory today as it associates with musculoskeletal pain. This is not by any means even a complete look at how it could be used to treat musculoskeletal pain or other types of pain um, that may be affecting the musculoskeletal system, but may not be um, due to some sort of physical injury. Uh, so yeah, I just, um, I had the privilege of studying with Jeffrey from uh, starting at Swedish where I graduated and then many years after that. So I'm just one of his many students and Tina and Donna and Sam have all been gracious enough to ask me to teach this and invite me out here. So I've put together these slides. If there are any mistakes, I'm sorry, it's been quite the week. And uh, I tried to put them together as much as possible um, in, an in an organizational fashion that also eventually will become clinically applicable. Um, so let's get started. All right, so first thing here, 
channel theory is a basis for acupuncture. So one of the important things to understand is that today, what we see is acupuncture is very point-based is not how acupuncture was actually developed. It was developed based on an understanding of these, these Jing Luo or these connecting channels that went all over the body. Right. And so this discovery and understanding of the channel systems and how they also layer on top of themselves in different layers of the body is something that's been developed over thousands of years um, in Chinese medicine to lay the foundation for acupuncture. And this is very much about how we interact with each other and also the outside world and how our body interacts inside with other things inside. So this is how the Chinese understood a lot of the medical reasoning for why these things did what they did and how they did. Um, so that's what's so important about understanding the channels. A lot of times when people say, Hey, well, well, you know, I can just use these points here. Well, large intestine four and liver three, they treat pain. Yeah. But understanding the layer of channel that you're needling and possibly why those needle or why those points you've selected are not working to be able to critically analyze your treatment and not just beat your head against the wall, doing the same thing over and over, but able to be like critically analyzing your patients and your treatment to make the treatment better or course correct. If you need to. That's, that's why channel theory was, you know, developed over time. Um, uh, beginning from the earliest texts on the treatment of channels via moxibustion, um, these things were later developed. So a lot of them started out, you can see in the earliest texts, the text from uh, Ma Wang Dui, um, these early, early silk scrolls and, and bamboo slips and things that were found in these, in these uh, tombs, you can see that the earliest um, descriptions of the channels came from the use of moxibustion. And so this use of moxibustion to feel and cauterize the, uh, an area of the body and then to feel the heat and to feel chi move along that area was really important to beginning the understanding of the channels. Um, these things are further expanded on. So by the time we get to the Huangdi Nei Jing, right, we have this idea of both in the Suwen and the Ling Chu, right? You have much more understanding of channels and how they're needled and different layers of channels, right? So you have the idea of... Um, the surface, you know, channels on the surface of the body, channels on the deeper layer and channels at the deep layer. So um, these are really important. So other texts that talk about this um, include, other than the Huangdi Nei Jing, um, include things like the, thanks. All right, now I've got a chat here so I can see what we're doing and I can see how goofy I look on the screen right now. <laughs> All right. Um, other um, other books include, or classics include the Nanjing, right? The classic of difficulties, right? The Jenjo Jai Jing, or sometimes referred as the Jai Jing, right? The systemized canon, a classic of acupuncture and moxibustion, um, and the Lei Jing, right? So this is the canon of classification. These things all talk about the different channel systems. Um, so just a little history as we get into this, so we understand uh, the Jai Jing was written by Huang Fumai, or Huang Fumi, right? And it was in the Jin dynasty. Um, so it was one of the earliest books specifically on acupuncture. It came before the Song Dynasty. And as we'll see, a lot of the stuff gets changed in the Song Dynasty. They truncate acupuncture. They sort of simplify it. They take out all the other channels. But Huang Fumi was able to write much more depth and clinical application of what was in the Huang Di Nei Jing, right? He references a lot of selections from the Huang Di Nei Jing. He references a bunch of passages from the Su Wen and the Ling Shu. He discussed discusses very clearly how they're applied clinically and how this is an understanding of the basis of Chinese um, medical theory. So very important book for those who have not looked into it. There is an English version. So I would consider if you don't read Chinese uh, to definitely get and read the English version. If you are not, or if you are an acupuncturist and you cannot read Chinese. Um, the Lei Jing was written by Zhang Jingyue, right? And this was this idea of the canon is of this categorization, right? Lei is this idea of categorizing. So he categorized a series of books into sections to make them easier for study. So what um, Zhang Jingyue did is he would take like, sections from the Neijing that were on a specific subject. And he would use those and make those the point of this area in the Lei Jing, right? And then he would take things from another subject that were all together and he would put them together. Because sometimes when you read, say, the Neijing, it can seem a little all over the place with subject matter. And so he tried to organize it so it was built in certain um, categories per subject. Uh, so throughout the Neijing, the foundational text of Chinese medicine, we have a lot of things that are discussed about acupuncture. So you talk about channel trajectories, right? You talk about channel physiology, what they do, right? And we talk about channel pathology. This is really important. In fact, in my own personal belief, the most important two things about this are the trajectory and the physiology. After you understand trajectory, you know where it goes. 
and then you understand the physiology based on the trajectory. Then from there, pathology is really easy because it's easy to understand where things connect, what they're supposed to do. And then if they're not doing it, why it's not happening. Um, unfortunately, today in school, and which is so predominant in uh, modern Chinese medical studies, is that we're taught everything based on pathology, pathophysiology, right? A lot of you guys probably remember this. When you start studying in school, a lot of it is, you know, you take all those pathophysiology classes, TCM patterns classes, right? That's pathophysiology, all that stuff. The problem is, is I feel like that leads us down a road where we're actually not deeply understanding our medicine and why it's done. You're only understanding it if it's not working, but then what happens if you don't know how it's supposed to work and the pattern isn't exactly fitting what you see in clinic. So it's really, or it's, it's the pattern that you studied isn't what you're seeing exactly in clinic. So it's really important to understand trajectory and physiology of the channel systems and even, you know, physiology of the Zongfu, which I think is talked about more in the, um, in uh, school today, but still not to the point of uh, being where I personally believe it needs to be. And it's definitely not really talked about in acupuncture. So I think two things that really need to be brought up in the realm of uh, the study of acupuncture and Chinese medicine are study of trajectories and the study of physiology. Let me just see here. Seems like everything is good. All right. Um, all right, examples of chapters. So I list here a couple of chat, uh, a couple of chapters from different books where they talk about different channel systems. Um, you guys can look these up. This is purely for your own kind of um, movement into understanding this more. I'm just giving you some things. I didn't explain here the basic primary channel chapters because it's talked about all over the place, and you guys are generally much more educated in that than anything else. So instead of listing primary. Um, chapters that would talk about primary channels. I, I list ones that talk about what we call the secondary channels, right? So the, the Jinjing, right? The Sinu channels talked about in the Su Wen, right? Chapter 51 in the Ling Shu, many, many chapters, right? In the Lei Jing, they talk about it, chapter four, scroll four and 69. In the Jai Jing, they talk about it in scroll two, chapter six, right? The Luo Mai, the Luo Vessels. They talk about the Luo Mai in the Su Wen. They talk about the Luo Mai in the Ling Shu, right? In the Jai Jing. Um, so the load vessels are talked about all through a lot of these books. <laughs> Again, this is not a comprehensive list of chapters. These are just an example. So you can go and find them to see how important they are to study these things, right? Not a channel-based approach, or not a point-based approach, a channel-based approach. <laughs> um, the Jing Bia, the divergent channels. Now this can be a little controversial because some people will say, well, they weren't really in you know, such and such chapter, this or that but there is an understanding that possibly the way they describe certain channels is more based on the divergent, um, how divergent channels are later described in the Jai Jing and things like that. So when you look at the, uh, the Huang Di Nei Jing and you don't necessarily see them talk about the Jing Bia, but you see some of the chapters and they're discussing it in a way that references the concept of how the, the Jing Bia, the divergent channels would work, say according to the Jai Jing and other things, the idea is that these chapters were probably codified in some sort of way that we're really discussing the divergence um, as we know them today. So we've got the Su Wen, the Ling Shu, and the Jai Jing for uh, the divergent channels. And obviously the Qi Jing Ba Mai, right? The eight extraordinary vessels. All the major books in Chinese medicine on acupuncture talk about this, right? Or the classics, the Huang Di Nei Jing, the Jai Jing, you know, even the Nan Jing talks about it, right? So there's a lot of Qi Jing Ba Mai discussed generally in, um, in, in a lot of the classics. The Nan Jing discusses predominantly the Jing Luo, the Luo Mai, Ooh. the Luo Mai, and the Qi Jing Ba Mai, right? It does not discuss the Jing Bia. It kind of just glazes over them. I mean, like when I say glaze, it doesn't even discuss them. It just kind of glosses over even any inkling of an idea that they were there. And it replaces a lot of the idea of what we use the divergence, the Jing Bia for. It replaces that with a Ba Hui Xue, which is the eight influential points. So any of you guys today who use, like in chapter 45 of the Nan Jing, they have this understanding of the, uh, the Ba Hui Xue, the eight influential or the eight meeting points. Um, they These are the ones that you guys use, the influential point of blood, right? The um, we have the influential point of the vessels, right? Lung seven, Tai Yuan. We have the idea of the influential point of the Zhang, right? Ji Xi, uh, Ji Xi. We've got this idea of the sinew influential point, right? Yang Ling Chen, gallbladder 34. So these 
points, actually, if you look at them and you layer them over the divergence, as you learn the divergence, you understand that a lot of these points mimic the divergence. An example would be, as we get deeper into this, the idea of the gallbladder and liver divergent helps to consolidate blood and move it into the sinews. Gallbladder 34 as a, um, as a point in and of itself has that effect. So, um, so that's something that gallbladder 34 does in and of itself. So a lot of times the idea of truncating all of the idea of liver gallbladder, even though gallbladder 34 doesn't completely encompass what liver and the gallbladder divergent channel does by any means, they, in the Nanjing, they seem to have taken those ideas and they have pushed them, pushed them, pushed them down to a single point. And so today in school, you guys learn a lot about the, or we all learn a lot about the influential points. Um, and that's the kind of the replacement for the divergence in the Nanjing. Just looking to see if we had any, no, nope, seems like we're doing well. All right. Um, so due to the nature of the description of both the presentation and pathology and needling methods, um, some have talked about uh, that their early descriptions of the Jingbia came from things like the Su Wen chapter 63. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, these, these ideas, which I mentioned before, include the idea of what they call uh, uh, tse, which is this technique of needling they described in chapter 63. So the Miutsu needling describes needling the Jing well points, three time needling, right? And it even discusses bleeding superficial low vessels, which is why some people get kind of confused as to if that chapter is really talking about the divergence, the Jing Bia or not, right? Um, so, and they also talk about needling the opposite side and the idea of crossing sides or diverting pathology to the opposite side of the body is a foundational idea of how the divergent channels work. Um, so some of the symptoms seen in Su Wen chapter three here, like the joints, right? The idea of uh, Zhu Xiaoyang, the gallbladder channel, or the collateral pathway, affecting hip flexion, these type of things are indications to some doctors that this was what they were talking about in that chapter. So when we learned it, for example, when we learned it in school, um, uh, one of the things that we were taught by Jeffrey is that his grandfather was one of the doctors who believed that this was a uh, codified chapter that explained um, information about the uh, the divergence in this chapter, although not directly saying that. They called them the Sun Luo. Um, but this idea we'll get into a little later. Um, so the Su Wen chapter 58 had previously stated that the Luo Mai do not penetrate the joints. But now in chapter 63, they start discussing joint flexion issues. So this isn't really the Luo Mai then if in chapter 58 of the Su they say, oh, Luo's don't penetrate the joints, but now we're talking about it affecting joint flexion directly, um, then it must be another channel. And this is where this theory kind of comes in for an understanding of the divergence in chapter 63 of the Su Wen. <laughs> all right, when did everything change? Because we have all these channels, right? We've got all these different channels, all these things, and then suddenly today, now we only have the, the Jing Luo, right? The primaries, well, why? When did this change? So this all started in the Song Dai, right? The Song Dynasty. Um, so in the Song Dynasty in uh, between 960 and 1278, right? You started to see these changes happen in Chinese medicine. Zhong Yi, right, is the Chinese term for Chinese medicine. So during the years of about 1026 to 1027 of the common era, the um, a common era, not the era, the era, the Imperial Medical Academy made a de decision to classify Zhenzhou acupuncture as secondary to herbs, to yao, right? They call this, today we call Chinese herbal medicine zhong yao. But before we differentiated, before we even had a Western medicine, we just called it yao, right? Um, so this was a historically a move towards a substance-based medicine because acupuncture would be more of a vibrational or a resonance type medicine, right? There's no actual substance that goes into your body. The needles go in, they create an effect and they get pulled out right? But with herbs, you ingest them or food, you ingest it, it goes in, it sits in your body for a while, your body breaks it down and has effects. That's a different idea. So when the Song Dynasty, they decided to move away from this idea of resonance-based medicine, they had questions about it, they decided to move away from it, and they started introducing this more substance-based medicine as a primary medicine. This is the number one medicine because we it makes more sense to us. That was kind of what happened in China. So things like Daoyin, right, or Qigong, this idea of energy and building chi through breath work and changing the function and the um, physiology of how the Jing Luo and the channels, the Luo Mai, all these different things work, plus the Zhang Fu, right? Affecting them through resonance-based things, Qigong, acupuncture, things like that became less popular. And the idea of taking herbs became the primary idea. So 
Due to this Imperial Academy decision, acupuncture was made smaller, it was truncated in an effort to simplify acupuncture to fit this view of the Imperial, of the Imperial Academy at the time. Well, today, that's kind of come down and that's kind of how we've all practiced acupuncture today in the major schools in the US, right? And even abroad. So the layers of the channel systems beyond the primary channels of Jing Luo and how to use other channel systems at all was removed within the Imperial Academy medical curriculum. Um, now, one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of um, books since or before from that time is because that would talk more about the channel systems is because of the fact that woodblock printing was started to really make it big in the Song Dynasty. It was perfected at the end of the Tang Dynasty, right? And it was made, it was used predominantly during the Song Dynasty. So now what happens is they start to print a ton of books in the Song Dynasty in mass that explain a lot about how you have just the primary channels working and the major focus is the primary channels, right? They also went and they started revising old books. So a lot of the classics we have today don't actually predate the Song Dynasty as far as our earliest copies of them. So they've been revised and edited sometimes to fit more of a Song Dynasty point of view, right? So examples here I gave are things like the Nanjing, the earliest copy comes from 1269, right? We know that these books like the Nanjing or the Neijing come from an earlier time, but because we know from the wording and the, you know, the way this is written, right? That, oh, this is definitely a warring states period use of words and how things are you know, done. But the earliest preserved copy of the Neijing we have is only about, is only from 1338, right? That's just after the Song Dynasty, right? The Zhenzhou Jai Jing was revised and printed in 1069. So this is the one, this version of the Genjo Jai Jing is the version that all major Genjo Jai Jing we get today are based on, right? So, the, so this is where we're seeing it coming from the Song Dynasty. Um, so the idea then to get rid of these channel systems outside of the primary channels, the Jing Luo, um, means that you don't ha even have continued investigation into secondary channels. You don't have continued building of books and scholarly education and you know studies being done on what these channels can do and you know discovering more and more and more about them like we do say herbal medicine or primary channels or things like that we don't have a ubiquitous number of books on that anymore so since the song dynasty we've really kind of killed a lot of that research right um we have a lot more on the jing Luo. So this means that in order to go back to really what you could even call classical acupuncture, you'd probably have to go back pre-Song Dynasty, right? So anything from pretty much Song Dynasty up, I don't know if you would, if it would be right to call that classical acupuncture. I think you'd probably want to call that, you know, um, post-revision acupuncture or revisionist acupuncture, right? Um, so these, this would mean that you would have to go and you'd have to study the Neijing, right? The Nanjing, you'd have to go study the Jai Jing. These books, the Lei Jing, these books would be really important to study. Um, so one of the major philosophers during the time of the Song Dynasty was a man named Zhu Xi, right? So Zhu Xi was a very prominent philosopher, a founder of Neo-Confucianism, and he presented the idea of Li Qi, right? So Li is this idea of principle, and Qi is obviously sub, uh, Qi is obviously this this Qi, this energy, right? So sometimes today it's translated the substance and phenomena theory, right? And so basically what he says is he says that under heaven, where there is Li, right? This idea of Li, this principle, there is also Qi. So you can't have Li without Qi, right? But also where there's Qi, you can't, you have to have Li, right? So wherever there's Qi, you have to have principle. So this idea of certain basic inherent principles about something when it has Qi. And this is this idea that started to enter Chinese thought and philosophical thought and affected every area of, um, Chinese um, development, including Chinese medicine. We'll see why this, uh, this kind of created what we see today. So this idea that anything that has qi or relationship has nature, and thus, so Zhu Xi went on to say that deepening, a study of deepening, understanding the connection to that thing, to understanding it through a natu the natural world through exhaustive studies was very important. So it sounds kind of like early science, right? Early Western science, like our ideas of how we look at things, right? So this was summed up in an idea that basically means that, so the idea is called Juji uh, Chongli, which means the idea of conducting oneself with cautious and respectful attitude when exploring the root of things. So meaning don't write it off, go in, respect what you're studying, look at it, 
and cautiously check to make sure you don't make mistakes as you study to try to understand it deeper, right? So this is this idea. And through this idea and method of studying in the Song Dynasty, these ideas of developing principles for the Zhang Fu started being um, created. So today, when we see principles, things like the liver harmonizes the emotions, right? So Gan Zhu Qing Zhi, this idea of the liver harmonizing the emotions. This is a Song Dynasty idea of a principle. This wasn't something that was pre-Song Dynasty. Um, so you never saw this um, uh, beforehand, right? So treatment principles to harmonize the liver, um, Harmonize, or to harmonize the liver, to harmonize the emotions are referred to a lot in modern TCM books, right? Or, um, but that wasn't a common, that was that kind of principle came from the Song Dynasty. That wasn't something you see in the Neijing, right? Um, so these things were developed. So that's why you want to go back and you want to look at the Neijing because a lot of the Neijing's understanding of principles were much more broad about how things connected. They weren't kind of singular and focused in the sense of smaller aspect of things, right? The emotions could affect any organ in the Neijing, right? They could affect the gallbladder. They could affect the kidneys. They could affect all these things. So the idea that the liver was a harmonizer, why wouldn't you go harmonize the kidneys or the gallbladder or the heart, you know, for certain aspects? That was more of an aging approach. But come the Song Dynasty, the idea that we kind of slimmed it all down and we ran it all through the liver based on a Zhangfu perspective, not even a channel perspective, right? So it's, this is why it's important to go study the channel systems. Um, so these types of Li, we're not in the Neijing or the Nanjing, right? So this development of single focus compartmentalized principles of knowledge rather than a dynamic wisdom based on the understanding of interconnectedness of acupuncture and channels as a whole through the layering of channel systems mirrors, it basically shows the truncation of acupuncture that began in the Song Dynasty also continues today in our education, right? Because what do we do? We have these like, these, um, these laws in Chinese medicine or these truths in Chinese medicine, people study to pass the boards, right? But a lot of those things were Song Dynasty based, right? Not necessarily um, uh, pre-Song Dynasty. So I think this is why it's important to go study these things. Um, all right, so understanding channel theory is also important because you need to understand where the pathology sits. Now I've included slides in here that are in Chinese. <laughs> I've gone and translated the majority of them, but sometimes when I run out of time, if it's late at night or I'm just running out of time, sometimes I'll pull translations from somewhere else um, just because it might be one in the morning or two in the morning, I'm getting exhausted. So if you see the Chinese in here, you'll always see a translation at some point. Um, so the next one here. So this, this chapter 50 from the Suwen talks about where pathology sits, right? So here is the, so this here is the idea. So you have Huang Di, talking to one of his, um, uh, his advisors, and they talk about how to needle based on pathology. So if any of you guys read Chinese, here it is. And then here is the translation, right? So what is this talking about? This is talking about levels of the body. When you read it in the Wang Din Aging, they don't say the word level, right? They refer to the physical structure that's at that area. So they say things like, if the disease is in the hair and the soli, the space between the skin and the tendons, it can be in the skin, right? The flesh, the vessel, right? Or the sinew or the bone or the marrow level. So whenever you see the disease in any of these levels, you need to be careful, right? So if the, if the disease is in the hair level or the soli level, it says needle it, but don't damage the level below, right? Don't damage the skin level, right? With your needling. So level of needling and technique is really important. So if it's in the skin level, right? If you needle the skin level, I mean, and it's in the solid level, then you can damage the lungs, right? And the lungs will be affected. And then in autumn, you can have things happen and you can get sicker, right? And then gradually this becomes, is weakens the ability for the lungs to disperse its chi, right? And the yang chi to come up and disperse in way. And so that's why they say you gain a fear of cold, right? Because it the lungs disperse their chi to tie on, right? If any of you guys took the Shang Hamun class, you guys know this. So it helps to keep cold out. But when they get weak, when their ability to shuan, right? Shuan, shuan fei is this idea of dispersing chi to the outside. So if you shuan, if you lose this idea of dispersing the chi to the outside, you weaken tai yang. So if you have a disease that's in the very surface of the body, right? And you needle deeper than that, and you drive it deeper, you will affect the ability of dispersing this wei chi out to there. And then you can actually develop disease from that, right? So 
Can you actually damage somebody with acupuncture? Yeah. And I don't just mean like sticking a needle in somebody's heart or lung. I mean, actually driving a pathology deeper. You can absolutely do that. And they talk about it right in chapter 50, right? So when something is in the skin, right? Needle the skin, but do not injure the flesh or do not injure the flesh. I'm sorry. So if the flesh is injured, this will affect the spleen. Why? We know that what the skin is controlled or under the auspices of the lung, right? We know that the flesh is under the auspices of the spleen. So if the spleen is affected, right, you will start to have certain issues they describe here. Abdominal distension and loss of appetite when the seasons change. The last 18 days of each season is what? Related to earth, right? And so it's this idea of seasonal change. Um, so this can be a problem. Now, if you have a disease in the vessels, right, or in the flesh, don't needle the vessels. So if you needle the vessels and they're injured, you can affect the heart. And this goes on and on about the sinews, about the bone, about the marrow. So this is really important. I just want to point out here, just as we start to come up on other things in this class, particularly the understanding of the sinew channels and the divergent channels, that notice here in this, in chapter 50, they talk about the idea of the sinews and the bone together. The reason why they talk about the sinews and the bone together, even though we think about the sinew sitting in the outside layer and the bone sitting in the inside layer, is because the sinews attach to the bone, particularly at the area of joints, right? So this is where the divergent channels can go out to the way layer and down to the deep layer. So that's the reason why when you read this and you think, oh, hair and, and the skin are on the out, or the, the solia are on the outside, the skin is on the outside, the flesh is starting to come on the inside, the vessels are in the inside. Wait, why do they say the sinew suddenly and then the bone? The sinew, aren't they on the outside? To keep you from being confused, they're describing the connection here of when you needle the sinews, how you don't want to drive it into the joints, right? Because the sinews can bind in the joints and you can actually push something into the divergence or into the body without meaning to when you want to bring it out. So that's the reason why it's organized in this fashion. No questions? Oh, I don't see it. Yeah, you don't have me logged in as a, you don't have me logged in as a, um, as a, what do you call it? So I don't know. You, don't you have me logged in as a panelist, not as a. Um... Oh, you cannot see the Q and A. No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it doesn't pop up. Okay. Usually it goes red. Yeah. See, so welcome to Q and A. No. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, the question is, uh -huh. the question is, what's an example of a disease on the hair level? And if you only tap the needle in, is that the hair you're treating the hair? Level? The very you're surface. Treating... Yeah. Generally, when you needle in, you're you're okay, treating. You oh, so. When you're, when you, when you're looking for something at the, like at the hair level, at the very top, you're looking for things that affect the idea of the pibu, the cutaneous regions, right? And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but this idea of that would be the very, very, very surface around the idea of the hair and the skin. So dermatological issues, things like that, that can occur on the very, very surface of the skin that relate to the ability to move chi outwards to the skin, well, to move the way chi outwards. Cause at the level of the cutaneous region, the body only moves Wei Qi out. It doesn't circle it back in. So when on the sinews, it actually cycles the, the Wei Qi back into the body again. But when you get to the surface at the Pi Bu, the cutaneous regions, it only moves things outwards. So this is the reason why you want to needle when you needle at the level of the hair and the soul. So when, when you talk about the level of the hair, level of the skin, you're actually talking about the hair yes. and the skin, not yes. in terms of um, TCM. When we think about Wei Qi Ying Xue, the exterior level, like for example, beginning of a common cold, mm -hmm. that is not considered your hair and skin. It level. is because that's when it comes in from there first. Oh, it is too. Yes. So not just the skin, this is why, yes, skin this, is, okay, this is why it's really important to understand the channels because when you understand the channels, you understand the actual physicality of where and how it happens. So your pores respond, your hair sticks up on end when it starts to get cold to try to trap heat. So you're getting this reaction right at the level of the hair. Your pores will either vasodilate or constrict depending on heat or cold, right? So things right at that surface are already reacting to what? Heat or cold. So it's actually happening, but a lot of times today in TCM, we don't even think about that because we're thinking from a Zhang Fu perspective, right? We're not even thinking level of channels. So to understand this in the Neijing, in the Suwen, they're actually talking about the physiological changes that the body is actually going on a tissue basis wherever the channels run. So this is getting a little technical here. Here you say needle this needle the skin, do not injure the flesh. So same thing, needle the hair, do not injure the skin. skin. Mm -hmm. So when you're just tapping the needle in, is that the skin or is that the hair? The, the very, very surface, most superficial needling is generally considered the hair. And then you go slightly deeper into the skin. 
So it would be like a very superficial um, uh, uh, so needling, very, very kind of like superficial, Japanese kind of like Japanese okay. acupuncture. That is Again, considered hair. Yeah, very surface. But this is a Suwen chapter fifty, right? So this is this is a, just a translation I did of that chapter. Um, so. But yeah, this is the idea, or you could think of it the hair, also the idea of rubbing, right? Rubbing to disperse, right? So rubbing to disperse cold, like people, when they rub their hand, when they rub their skin, when they rub their hair, this idea of warming things up on the outside to disperse cold. on. So it's this very physical, physiological understanding. I think I see the chats now. Um, so this is this idea between the idea of the integument, right? The dermis, the epidermis, the hair, all of these things are actually described in the Suwen, right? They have, you know, 2000 year old Chinese, um, uh, uh, Chinese um, terminology when describing them. All right, let's go on here. Um, I think I'm joined in as a panelist now, so I think I can see more. Um, okay, then we can see the question. I think I, oh no, this is a chat, let me see. But I can see, let me see, Q&A, still no questions. So let's just ask people to type them. Type them into the yeah. chat and then Donna will, or Tina will try to keep me informed of them as we go along. All right. So this is what's important. So you see how this, these, all these levels are interacted, right? We're going to see how this relates to a channel, uh, to the channels and how the channels flow through them, right? Why? Because interconnectedness is where you find true healing. Understanding the connection to the body and the channel systems and the, you know, of that person will lead you to a greater understanding of yourself and your patients and can bring about much better results. That's where true healing lies, understanding that we're all connected. Everything's connected. Everything's an interconnection, right? Uh, what's a popular book we have in Chinese medicine people read in their first year, right? The web that has no weaver. That's this idea of interconnectedness, right? Um, let me see. Uh, so this is something that I think I showed the other day when we were having our seminar or the one hour. This is something I wrote up uh, based on notes from school that and you know, what I've seen in clinic. So this is an anatomical understanding of where those things, you know, sit, right? So we have the way layer. So you see at the top, we have the skin. So just above that would be the hair, right? So this is this idea of the hair. And just below that, you would have the sinews, right? Now the space between this skin, this skin and the hair where you kind of have like the fluid runs in the epidermis, you have these, you know, this lymph and all these things that run, that's this idea of the soli, right? So those areas, that area is called a pipu, right? The cutaneous region, right? We're going to talk about that. So then the next level under that in the way level are where the sinews are, according to Chinese medicine, or the level of the sinews, right? They can go to a deeper level, but they're still within the way, but you can feel them kind of bind to the bone, right? They're not, you don't feel them just under the skin. They can go to the way level. But the idea is that they generally run and affect the surface of the body, right? Um, so the yin level, at the yin level, you have the idea of the, the vessels, right? The mai, right? And you have the idea of the G, the flesh, or the, the muscle, right? That underbelly of the muscle that gives you like substance, right? The Chinese, sometimes they say jiro, right? This idea of like, of muscle. And at this level, you have the idea. So of the vessels, you have the, the level of the mai, you have the, it's the level of where the lo mai, the lo connecting channels are, right? And then at the level of the flesh, this is where your jing luo, your primary vessels run. Now, also in the yin level, you have the area. This is where your zang fu, your organs, this is where they function. They function, they run here. So keep this in mind that when you're looking at things from a zang fu perspective, you're looking at how things in the yin level move out to affect the way, right? Or somehow interact with the yuan level. But you're really focusing still on the yin level. When you do primary channels, right? The Jing Luo, you're looking at the level of the yin as it connects to the way level, or as it kind of dips and interacts through what? The Yuan source points, right? To the Yuan level, right? But the Jing Luo, the primary vessels don't go to the Yuan level. They don't go there at all. They may go to the way level, but they do not go to the Yuan level. They can interact with the Yuan level via Yuan source points, but they don't actually go there. This idea too of the luo mai, right? The luo vessels. So where you see the mai, the vessels, right? Um, so the luo mai next to it. Those are the low connecting vessels. They sit in the yin level. When they get full through kind of hydraulic pressure, they push up into the way vessel, but they are still contained, or to the way layer, but they are still contained. So they're technically a yin level vessel that's pushing up fully contained into the way layer, 
right? They kind of do this thing where they push the way layer down a little bit and they come up on top of it. And that's why we can see low vessels, right? We can see these varicosities that need to be bled. And we'll talk about that more. Um, and then the last, the most deepest level, right, is the yuan level, right? You have the gu, the bones, right? You have the sui, the marrow, and you have the jing bia, right? The divergent channels exist in that level. And they communicate with the wei level, and then they communicate with the yuan level. They go back and forth. They're able to jump the ying level, right? They, go, they, they don't have to really pass through the ying level. Really, they're able to go directly from the yuan to the wei, yuan to wei. They don't really deal with the ying level at all. And then the qi jing ba mai, right? So the eight extraordinary vessels, they exist. They're the deepest level in the UN level. They live in the, in the marrow, in the bone, right? In the brain, um, in the qi hung zhu fu, right? The, the curious organs, right? And there are also aspects of the zhang fu that exist in the UN level. Things like the gallbladder, right? The gallbladder, the, um, the, it's a curious organ. It exists in the UN level. It exists partially in the ying level, partially in the UN level. You have these aspects that can affect both. Um, you will have, I see some people asking questions um, here about the Chinese. You're going to have all of this written out in pinyin as we go through a lot. So you'll notice my lectures, I try to include more and more and more pinyin and explanations for things because I think it's really important that people learn these things and learn what they mean because it's not a one-to-one. -one. I can say spleen, right, in English, but spleen doesn't really mean P, right? So it doesn't really mean that. So that's the reason why I uh, P, like the Chinese term for spleen doesn't really mean Western spleen. So I put these things in here and I'll keep them up just so that people can start to think in that way. It's helped me through school. So I figured it would help people um, as these things go on. Um, is the third column in Chinese, the channel type? No, the third, oh yes. The third column in Chinese is the, is the, um, is the channel type. So, and we'll, we're going to talk about that right now. All right. So the way level, what is the way level, right? This is the external, right? The most exterior part of the body. At this level of our body, this deals with the interaction directly with the environment outside, right? So my skin, it sits on the desk, right? It directly interacts the hair and the skin. The sinews are about manipulation of my outside environment. It helps me to stand up. It helps me to sit down, right? My zangfu don't do that. My external level, my ying level doesn't directly do that. It might tell my way level to do that, but my way level is actually the, the manifestation of that outside being able to do that, right? So the idea of the pee, the skin, and the gin, the sinews. They deal directly with climatic factors. They deal directly with external pathogenic factors, pestilence, ecological factors, right? They're these external things. This is the layer, this layer and the, um, and the chi that runs in it, right? The wei chi um, are the drive of the body. They include unconscious reflexive actions to the environment. You know, somebody, you know, a mosquito bites you, you react to it, right? Or it starts to get hot and you sweat, right? Those type of things. You don't think about it. You're not like, oh, it's hot. Let me sweat. <laughs> you know, you don't have to think like that, right? Um, some people might argue that that's what you do when you punch a jerk in the face, right? I didn't think about it. I just punched him, right? <laughs> the reflexive. But like, this is the idea of like the way chi, right? The reflexive action. So the way layer, you have a couple of things, right? And we're going to circle back. You'll see that the way I teach this is overlapping circles to help you guys understand more and more and more. And you've noticed if you've taken my Shang Lun class or the Wen Bing class, that um, that's how I do it to try to help people understand. That's the way that I understand better. Um, so the in the way level, we have the people, right? So the cutaneous regions as related to the skin, right? The very surface anatomy of the body the most external level of the way that releases Wei Qi outwards. So in the level of the skin, it's moving this Wei Qi outwards. That Wei Qi is not recirculating back in. And you can kind of see that too, when if you've ever worn like a sauna suit or you've ever been in a car on a cold day and the inside of the car starts to what steam up, your body's releasing heat, right? And fluids outwards. It's not cir circulating them back in. It's releasing in that level, it's releasing it outwards, right? So you can see that in the level of the, the cutaneous regions, right? Um, it's the furthest exterior physical structures of the body. So the skin, the integument, the pores, the body hair, these things are all the idea of the people, right? Um, the lungs are considered to govern this region, right? The skin. So it says in the Su Wen chapter five, it says, uh, which means that the lungs govern the skin and hair, right? In the Su Wen chapter 21, it says that food enters the stomach for digestion. The thin refined essence of the food is distributed to the liver. The less refined chi goes to the sinews. Why? Because the liver controls the sinews, right? So that's why it gets, goes to the liver first and then it moves to the sinews through that. 
food enters the stomach for digestion and the turbid essence of the food goes to the heart. This is the year that they're referring to, right? The essence goes to the vessels. The vessels chi flows to the channels. Channel chi goes to the lungs. The lungs assemble or govern the hundred vessels. Lungs transport the essence to the skin and body hair. So this is this idea that the lungs are moving it to the body hair, whereas the liver, according to chapter 21, moves it to the sinews. So this is really important because you'll see later on as we start to treat things that there could be elements of the connection of the Zongfu and the channel system that are important um, as you treat the channels. So the channels here, the Pibu. So we talked about the Pibu. Now we're going to talk about the Jinjing, the sinew channels. So the sinew channels are tendinomuscular layer of the body. These are involved in locomotion. These are conduits of Wei Qi interacting with the external environment, right? Physiologically, these control things like temperature changes and movement of the body. Now, when we think about this and we think about the Jinjing, a lot of times they're broad and they're a little thicker than the, the cutaneous regions. So a lot of times you'll see that when treating the surface of the body for cutaneous regions, we don't oftentimes directly needle. We don't think about needling the cutaneous region for the sake of the cutaneous region. We oftentimes, because the chi doesn't always circle back in, we treat the sinews to treat the cutaneous region, or we treat the divergent channels to treat the cutaneous region. That's why you see the temperature changes. Why? Because you have to take in an effect all the way to the sinews, and then you take in that information, and then it moves back out to warm your body up or cool your body down, right? So pathophysiologically. So pathophysiologically, um, areas uh, which react to the external pathogenic factors, right? You start to shiver, your, your tendons tighten up, you feel achy, right? This is at that level. It can still affect the cutaneous regions and have the pores shut down and the hair stand on end, but it's from the sinew level, from the jinjing that you get that response, right? Where that Wei Qi is cycling. Um, so Wei Qi reacts to this external factor, resulting in what we know as things like wind cold or wind heat. Another example of the interaction of the Wei level for things are like a sneeze. When you sneeze, you have a very strong tendinal reaction, right? You can feel your muscles tighten up, your diaphragm, your, your muscles, everything gets real tight. And as you get this push outwards to push this pathogen or this reaction out of the body, what also happens is you can feel your pores slightly open. So you're trying to release the exterior, right? And you get this kind of push and tightening to push everything to the surface, right? Through the, through the way level, through the Qingjing, through the sinew channels. But you also get the pibu, the cutaneous regions, the pores open and you micro sweat. And this is the idea of moving yang out to help clear external pathogenic factors. So this can be seen in sneezing. All right, the yin level, right? So the yin level, this is internal. So we're now officially in the internal level. Um, so whereas this level here is the external uh, factors, this level is more internal factors. I want to apologize to all my fans online because when I wrote my Shang Hanlong class, um, I accidentally wrote down that the emotions in the diet were part of the external. I was running on zero hours of sleep. I was working full time and I wrote 400 slides. And so I just read from my slides through most of that presentation. And I miswrote that there was diet and emotions in the external factors. That was a mistake of my own because I was just overly tired, but somebody apparently had a big problem with it online. <laughs> so uh, I see you out there, my fan. I love you too. All right, let's see. <laughs> All right. Um, at this level of conscious action, uh, at this level, the internal level, conscious actions are developed. Um, and they can, um, they can occur at this level. So you can think about things, you can think about what happens, but also some unconscious, you know, actions happen. They happen because you get that Wei Qi moving inwards, right? So unconscious actions on the inside, like the heart are actually due to the movement of the Wei Qi internally through the yin sinews, which we'll touch on later on. But for the most part, this aspect of the yin level is dealing with the cognitive aspect of the body, right? Choices and passions, what one wants and what one needs, right? This deals with internal pathogenic factors. It deals with emotions, dietary issues, lifestyle issues, right? Um, internally, the ability to change comes from applying conscious awareness and action to things. So this is what comes from the yin level. So when you want something to change, when you have an injury to the sinews and you know that the way to get it better is going to be to move that thing, move that leg to strengthen it again, you actively apply 
active. Every day I'm going to go out, I'm going to do this, right? To make it better. It's not just like, oh, rest up till it gets better and you're not doing anything and the body does it itself. You actually might have to actively apply something to that to get it better. So you're using the yin to create a change in your life, right? I'm going to not eat these sweets so I can lose weight. You're actively applying a cognitive action to something, right? So this is the level of consciousness that comes from the yin level, right? Uh, let me just double check here. All right, well, good. Um, internally, the ability to change, oh, I said this comes from the yin level. So the, the G, right, the flesh is really what holds everything together. So at this level of the yin, this is what holds like the bones, the nerves, the skin, everything together because the flesh moves up to connect the surface. You can think of this as connective tissue and it moves down. And we're going to talk about this. It's very similar to the understanding of fascia in the West. Uh, so in the yin level, we have the lo mai, right? The lo mai, lo means connecting, right? So connecting network vessels. And these are these, these are our blood vessels, right? The physiolog uh, physiologically, they are involved in the movement of blood and fluids in the yin level, right? A lot of times you'll see as taught in school that they are created only when pathologically needed, you know, to store something. And we'll touch on this again a little later. We're not going to get too into this. But actually, if you read the Neijing and you actually study this, there are aspects of the laws that exist regardless of pathology, just because they're doing their thing, but we don't treat them, right? Unless they're pathological. So Da Bao, right? The great low of the spleen that is talked about in the Ling Shu as being controlling the network of Lo Mai. That's its physiological thing. It controls a network of Lo Mai. And this is the, it also controls the blood, the shit in the network, right? So this is a physiological thing. So sometimes we're taught that Lo Mai are only developed for pathological reasons. That's the reason why Chinese medicine looks at them because we're taught everything through a pathological lens. But if you look at it through a physiological lens, these lomai, they do exist. We just don't treat them because we don't see them. We only treat them when we see them, right? When they become observable when they become full and then they empty again, they become non-observable again, but we still see them dump into the primaries or all these other things. But there are aspects of the law, the great law of the stomach, right? Uh, Shu Li, this is the root of the pulse, according to the Su Wen chapter 18, right? It reflects the idea of Zong Qi in the chest and stomach Qi. This is essentially the heartbeat. The heartbeat comes from the idea of Shu Li in, in the Neijing, right? So this is a physiological aspect of the great low of the stomach. Um, pathologically, these channels can be created as needed and they store and they hold pathology away from the Jing Luo, right? Um, only two Jing Luo move, or I'm sorry, only two Luo Mai connect to their respective Zhang Fu, right? The heart, the Xin, and the pericardium, the shin bao, right? So when they are created pathologically, they are intended to be bled. You have to bleed them. The body's trying to push something up away from the primary channel. You got to bleed it to release it. This is how the law might work, right? Somebody has a question. I'm wondering that it is the lymphatic system. So one of the interesting things that you'll find is that the, when you study the jimbia, right? The divergence, because the lymphatic system goes all the way down to the marrow. So the lymphatic system is probably an aspect of the divergent channels. That's what I would say it is. That's how I learned it as. Um, that's how Jeffrey Ewan taught it to us, is that the, the divergent channels, he would say, are a crude representation of the, of the lymphatic system. I would say, from my own clinical you know, experience, that I, I kind of think that the lymphatic system are an aspect of the divergence. But as we understand lymphatic today, they don't completely do everything the divergence does. So currently, I would say they're an aspect. But we may discover as things go on that the lymphatic system is actually you know, the entirety of the, of the divergence. Who knows? All right, let's see. Um, so then in the yin level, we have the jing luo, right? So let's see here. All right, so we have the jing luo. So the primaries, right? The primary channels exist in the flesh, right? So they exist in the divides in the flesh, right? Because they talk about this, how you feel, and you can feel when you feel channels, you feel divides in the flesh as you palpate, right? So they exist in the flesh. These are the ones everybody studies, right? This is like the connective tissue that's connecting all levels, right? So the trajectories move into the way level, right? The flesh comes up to the musculoskeletal system. It surrounds nerves. It supports the skin. It surrounds blood vessels, right? In the, in the yin level, it connects to the blood vessels and the zang fu, right? 
um, in the yuan level through the idea of the yuan source points, right? The yuan xue or the the fa hui xue, right? These eight influential points, or even the hosi points, right? The hu xue. These ideas of the hosi points. This is how the primary channels are able to interact and touch yuan qi, right? So they're able to touch this level through that, but they don't actively move through the level, right? They communicate with the level through these areas, but they don't actively move through there. Um, so, th but this doesn't mean, so even though they're able to communicate, this doesn't mean that the Jing Luo move deeply in the Yuan, but rather they connect and communicate via certain locations along their trajectories. So that's where they kind of stop off and communicate a little bit. Um, all right, last level here is the Yuan level. So in the Yuan level, we have the Gu, right, the bone, and we have the Sui, the marrow, right? So the constitutional level is the Yuan level. So when you hear somebody say constitutional level in Chinese medicine, obviously the Yuan level. This is the level of the Jing, right? This is where prescribed and, con um, and congenital and even predestined influences move from. So this can be considered the deep, deep subconscious of the person, right? Um, and this is the level at which ancestral inheritance and cosmological influence takes place. So this gets a little into the, um, the spiritual aspects of acupuncture. A lot of them are very much you know, rooted in shamanism, Taoism, and these type of things. Uh, the concept of the Ling Shen, right, is this soul, right? It enters the Jing, right? So it enters the essence, and it becomes embodied by the essence, right, the Jing. So the Ling Shen is intent when it comes into this lifetime. The idea is that it kind of has a contractual agreement to come into this lifetime in order to fulfill a series of lessons in this lifetime. That's why it gets reincarnated, right? Or incarnated, we should say. So this curriculum is particular to assist the incarnation of the Ling Shen, right? Through this present lifetime. So this is what allows it to come in. So this is where it's binding. It's binding into the Yuan level to be incarnated, fleshed out, right? To live its life, right? So the Jing generates the Sui. And then from there, generates the bone. So it lays down the center layer of things, and then it generates the outer layer from there and the outer from there and the outer layer from there. So your end is always laid down first, and then things build off of it, right? And we'll see this in the channels. So the Jing is the, is the yin yin, right? So we know that Jing is yin yin, the yin fluid. Now, postnatally, it becomes supported by the postnatal yin yin. So prenatally, when you're forming or in your constitution and the end level, Generally, the idea is that the jing in that kind of prenatal idea of forming in the belly is the idea of prenatal yin yin. But when you're born, the postnatal yin yin, the blood, right, and the jin yin, they go to support the jing, the essence, right? So the postnatal yin fluids go to support the jing. So this is why sometimes in Chinese medicine, we say, oh, you really can't tonify the jing. You have what you have, and that's that. Well, not according to Taoist alchemy right? The idea of supporting this stuff so much, supporting the blood till you have an abundance of postnatal chi and blood, that then you can filter it back in through the eight extra channels to support the essence again, right? The eight extra channels can absorb excess, right? Not just pathological excess, but physiological excess too, where things can go and nourish the jing, right? And so this is this idea you'll see in, in alchemy of like a hundred days to change the jing, right? 100 days to change the person at a genetic level, at a constitutional level. Um, all right. So evolution takes place at this level. So at the level of Yuan, right, this is where evolution takes place. This is, the, um, um, this is where you evolve because of disease. You evolve to live with disease. You evolve to overcome disease. You evolve to deal with environmental changes. You evolve to overcome environmental changes because what happens? If you don't evolve to deal with these changes, you will die off, right? So this is where this starts, right? Where does it start? Even in Western medicine, we understand this, right? It starts with the DNA, right? It, that's where the change, that cemented change is going to happen. That evolution will start from there, right? So does, it filters in through the external, through the way, right? The reaction to the way and the reaction to the yin. And then over time, the body starts to realize, hey, I got to do this. I got to change. I got to make a change. So where does it start to make the change after interacting on the way and the, and the yin level? It makes that change at the yin level, which then filters out, right? Because we know, and we'll get into this later, but we know the idea of chong mai, right? The blueprint. It's like this laying down basis for the body. That's going to give your body the understanding of how it's supposed to build and what it's supposed to do through life. That's the, you know, base genetic code, 
you know, and then how it gets played out. And so this is the level of your end that can evolve, right? So when the end of the jing reaches the point of great taxation and can no longer hold latency, this is when you find that the diseases at the yuan level will appear. This is when you find diseases affecting the qi jing ba mai. This is when you find diseases affecting the jing bia, right? You'll find these things at that level. So let's talk about the jing bia. Um, so uh, so, so um, there will be, if you look on this page, there should be, I guess this is one of the ones I missed it. As we go through, you'll see that most things have um, pinion written next to them. Some don't, but some of the things like chi, I just figured people would know that. But if you look here at this one, for example, this this slide, it says Yuan, it says it right at the top of the page. So if there was another place on the page where I wrote Yuan, I might not have written it just because it's like the point of the slide. Um, so the Yuan level, right? So the divergent channels, they exist at the level of Yuan Qi, right? They originate at major articulations, the knees, the hips, and the shoulders. They move between the Wei, right? And the Yuan. So they move from the deepest level to the um, uh, to the surface, right? They support the Jing Luo, right? They support the idea of the uh, primaries. They move substances. They move the essence, right? Jing. They move blood, Xue, right? And they move the Jin Ye, the fluids, to support the Jing Luo and the Zhang Fu. So this one doesn't have Zhang Fu. Sorry, this must have been a late night slide. So it supports the Zhang Fu. It redirects and translocates pathology. Um, the Jing Luo and the Zhang Fu might have trouble dealing with away from them. Right, so the idea with the divergence is it directs things away, um, and uh, directs things into the Yuan level, right, to induce latency. So the Jing, the Shui, right, the Jin and the Ye, the Qi and the Yang, are all consolidated using the Jing Bia, the divergence, to translocate pathology and hold it in latency. All right. So, um, uh, let's see here. So. The rear end level, let me see here. Do, 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 do. Slow down a bit. I think it's be hard to keep up with. Okay, I'll slow down. Um, so the Qi Jing Ba Mai, right? This is the deepest level. These are the eight extraordinary channels. They move into the level of the marrow, right? The DNA. These vessels are the deepest ones. They move through the level of the base matrix of the constitution. So whenever you think of something in the body being Qi Jing Ba Mai, think of the most basic level of the body. Think of the marrow, think of the DNA, think of the most center aspect of that person at every layer, whether it's cellular or whether it's larger physical body, right? So these vessels move through a level of base matrix and constitution. Um, these, this level deals with the deepest part of a person's self. How to discover oneself, right, is done through the idea of cultivating one's eight extraordinary channels, right? This is a level at which things evolve. Um, if somebody's asking me questions or they're posting on this, I will try to glance back and forth, but it's actually, I'm running off of two computers here. So it's not on my main screen. So if you feel I'm ignoring you, uh, it's not because of that. It's just because I'm not, I'm doing one thing and I have to go back. Holding latency. Holding latency means when the body holds on to something. So you, you it's in your body, but it's holding it hidden. And it's unable to express itself pathologically because the body is using some sort of substance. It's either using jing, blood, fluids, chi, something to hold it down and to keep it trapped so it doesn't affect the body, right? Um, things that that happens to uh, chicken pox, right? You can get shingles, um, things like this. Some people find that it happens with Lyme. You go through times where you get flare-ups and then it goes away, right? So there are a number of diseases where the body does this with, right? Particularly when they're having trouble dealing with it, they will put it in the latency. Um, all right. Um, uh, yes. So somebody says, is latency similar to a lurking pathogen? Yes. Um, the idea of fu qi, right? This latency, this lurking pathogen that's below the level where you're not really seeing many symptoms. Maybe they're really minor at the time. They're hidden. That's the idea of a lurking pathogen. You know, now the difference between somebody in the West who might think it's a lurking pathogen, but they actually might have symptoms, right? Like for example, I've, there's a case of, I know somebody who talked about their friend, their friend had died um, unexpectedly from pancreatic cancer. Um, well, the friend, when I was, when described to me, like what the symptoms were, the friend was so happy that she had lost a bunch of weight, but she had had a bunch of symptoms for pancreatic cancer. She was overlooking that wasn't a latent cancer. 
right? But there are aspects in Chinese medicine, like this person mentioned herpes, where you really don't see a pathogen, right? You don't see an expression of that pathogen. And then suddenly you get a uh, presentation of it. And then it goes away completely. The presentation goes away and you feel better. And, oh my God, it's like, I don't have it. And then suddenly it comes back again, right? So when it goes away and it seems like you don't have it, that's latency. Um, could we treat autoimmune diseases and fix DNA mutations through these channels? That is the idea to treat using the Jingbia, right? The divergence or the Qi Jingba Mai. Autoimmune generally runs in the level of the divergence, right? And the affecting the DNA is understood via the idea of the affecting the Yuan Qi. So using the eight extraordinaries, the Qi Jingba Mai, right? Or even the Jingbia in some ways to affect structural changes as associated with um, the channels and trajectories of the divergence could be done. Um, we won't be getting into that in this level of the class. Again, I really, really, really suggest that anybody who wants to know more about this, buy Jeffrey Ewan's NISA transcripts, buy the classes on Vimeo that he teaches in depth, all of these things. He has classes on every channel system. Every class is about 12 hours long, split up into two hour videos. Um, you know, these are things, and then go and study with him directly. I strongly suggest that you do this. I did this. I, you know, I was an actual student of his student, student at his school, you know, and I mean, there aren't many people out there teaching it in this depth. And so I would strongly suggest that, uh, you, if you want to know more about these channel systems, you go and, um, buy his Vimeo videos, buy the NISA transcripts, N-E-S-A NISA transcripts, where he is recorded teaching these things and study them, use them, you know, take your time to uh, spend a month or two months in the clinic, only using one channel system to try to treat as many things as possible to see how it works, right? That's important. Uh, Nisa stopped selling the transcripts. I wonder where, um, where you can get them. I would have to look online. I have them, but I know other people have gotten them. I know they've been floating around the internet. So I'm sure if you Google, you can find them. Um, why are the divergence used to treat COVID? Well, I did a whole lecture on that. <laughs> um, you can go and look at my lecture as to why, but one of the things that you can see with um, divergence is that divergent channels are very, very successful at treating um, uh, pestilence that moves through the body very rapidly and the body kind of plays hot potato with trying to keep it away from organs. And as the body's kind of on fire, you know, like just, you know, there's all these problems and all these systems shutting down the Zongfu and this and that the body will try to translocate the pathogen back and forth and back and forth. So when I treated COVID at this point, I've treated over a hundred cases of COVID face to face. I treated probably uh, over 300 in total, many of them sending herbs to them. Um, I've never lost the patient guys. And I treated the majority of the severe, severe cases with, I treated all the severe cases with divergence and it works very, very well. I've even treated um, reactions um, my, my own grandfather actually nearly died from, uh, his second, uh, Pfizer MRNA shot. He developed simulated COVID symptoms, but without the actual virus. And he went into a severe, severe attack of the same type of pneumonia that, you know, people get from COVID. And I treated him with divergence and I had to use herbs with him because he was much older. He's 88 and he was very weak and he hadn't eaten in, in, in almost a week and a half. So I had to give him herbs to give him some sort of chi, but it was after giving me the herbs, when I would needle him, I'd immediately get results, right? So I used divergence uh, for him as well for part of that. So that's why divergence worked very well for COVID. Um, we're not going to get into the divergent um, uh, COVID stuff because that's not the point of, um, of this whole seminar. Uh, so you guys will have to go look at that seminar. It's three hours. It's pretty in depth. You know, I did that. I, I, wrote that up in an afternoon because I'd been treating a lot, a lot of COVID patients by that point. I figured I could help. Hopefully now that I'm here in California, I actually have audio of treating one of my COVID patients and you can hear how quickly acupuncture changed their breathing. So maybe if we can get the masterful Sam Lin to create a video out of the audio and you guys can post it, eLotus can post it on their site. You can hear how quickly acupuncture works to take somebody who can't breathe with COVID induced pneumonia and the acupuncture gets some breathing again like that. So maybe that'll be something cool, but not the point of this lecture. So, um, so here we go. So eight extras, right? So we've got this. So important again, physio anatomy and physiology as understood by Chinese medicine is really, really, really important because that's how we understand how it's built. Right. I think one of the issues we run in today is 
I have a degree in biology, right? Physio neurobiology focus from the University of Connecticut. So that means I was like, I was like two classes away from a chem minor. I took all these biology classes. So I studied Western biology and it's important to do that. But I think when we study Chinese medicine, we really, really, really should be studying Chinese anatomy and physiology in depth. So we understand Chinese medical anatomy and physiology because of where a lot of people have trouble even understanding Chinese medicine when they're studying it because they're not given those basics. And I think this is really important. So this will also help you to understand the idea of yin and yang, right? So yin yang aspects of the body. Um, so the idea here, so yang, right? This is yang, the first character. Yang aspects are associated with the structural aspects of the body, the bones, right? The the idea of the, the skin, right? The, the sinews, these things that give us structure, right? So the idea here is the yang of yang, right? Or I'm sorry, the yin aspects. Let's talk about that first. The yin aspects are associated with the internal zang fu, right? The internal organs, that which is internal that we don't see. Yang is that which is external that we see. So we see my skin and, and sinews, right? That create my face. We can see the cheekbone, right? We can see the aspect of the my bony head, right? We can see the elbows, right? And the, and the flesh on the outside, the, the skin. This is all yang, right? Internal is what you don't see, right? And when you see that yin come out, that internal come out, that's oftentimes when it presents pathologically, right? So the yang of yang are the jin, are the sinews, right? The yin of yang are the gu or the gu jia, right? Gu jia means the joints. So this is gu is bone and gu jia is joint. Right. So the idea here is you have this idea of bones and joints create what the physical structure on the inside that the sinews are laid over on the outside. Right. Um, so, um, so this is this idea now the yang of yin, right? So the yang of yin is the fu is the, is the yang organs, right? The bowels. So why? Cause they're in the yin aspect of the body, but they're the yang organs, right? So they're the fu, right? And then the yin of yin are the zang, right? The zang organs, the ha, uh, the solid yin organs, right? So that's the yin of the yin, right? This is really important because these aspects will help you to understand with acupuncture how to treat different levels of the body based on the channel systems. This is super important to understand this as you get deeper into acupuncture. Um, the other day, Tina and I were talking about this lecture. And she goes, this isn't as basic as I thought it was. Well, I think that these things, the reason why it doesn't seem as basic is because these things that we didn't get in school, which we should have gotten in school, I put a lot of those references in the lecture. So these are basic. So study this, know this, the idea of the jin, the sinews, right? The gu, the bone, right? The gu jia, the joints, right? The fu are obviously the fu organs and the zang are the zang organs, but these things are aspects of the different levels of the body. And this is really, really important um, because you're, this is how you're going to treat with the, with the sinews as you get going. Another thing to understand the source of fluids. So some of these notes do come out of um, some of the other lectures I've done. I've just cut and pasted them. Uh, if you guys want more information about the source of fluids and how they're affecting the basic Jing Luo, the primaries, check out. Go by the um, the Shang Hun Lun uh, uh, seminar. That one I did an in depth presentation on Shang Hun Lun and how it treats acupuncture, uh, how to treat Shang Hun Lun conditions with acupuncture, um, as we learned it in school. To really, it's a more in depth presentation as far as Shang. I've never really seen Shang Hun Lun acupuncture presented publicly before, except for inside our school, and so I compiled the notes to try to help people understand that. Um, so go check that out. I talk a lot more about the physiology and the way the channels relate in that. So, uh, the, the primary channels really, the, what they call the Lu He, the six levels, right? So, so fluids, right? Food is digested by the way, the stomach, right? So food and drink are processed via rottening and ripening of the digesting of the stomach. Fluids are extracted from food and drink via the process. The stomach distributes Gu Qi, right? Food Qi and the Jin Ye, the fluids thick and thin, Right. The gu qi is extracted from the food and is ascended by the action of the pi zang, right? The spleen upwards to the chest. The jin ye are separated into two groups, right? The jin and the ye. And that's important, right? The jin are the thin fluids. So they're the pure fluids. You have two aspects of, 
of each of these fluids, right? So when you have the gin fluids and the yeah fluids, they also break up. So we call gin the pure fluids and the yeah the turbid fluids. But then the gin fluids also have their pure fluids and their turbid fluids, and the yeah also have their pure fluids and their turbid fluids, right? So you have this two aspects, pure and turbid aspect of the pure gin fluids, right? The pure aspect of the gin fluids moves to moisten the orifices up top. So the eyes and nose and mouth, these things, right? Um, so the turbid fluids go out to the skin and the sinews to become Wei Qi, right? And flow, and it flows with Wei Qi and becomes Wei Qi. We talked about this before in the previous slide where we talked about the idea of um, turbid aspects going to the liver, right? Aspects going to the lung, the lung brings things to the skin, the liver conducts things to the sinews, right? We talked about that earlier. The yeah fluids, right? Turbid fluids. They also have two aspects, as I said. Um, the yeah is viscous and it moves slowly. It moves in to lubricate and supplement the jing, right? It goes to the zhang fu, right? The bones, the joints, the marrow, the brain. So let me bring this back so you can see something here. So we just said that the turbid aspect of the jin goes to the skin and sinews. Here we go. What's that? That's the yang of yang, right? That's the jin, right? So that's the yang of yang. So the jin turbid fluids are going to the yang of yang. The ye, right? So the ye is going to what? The idea of the zhang fu, the bones and the joints. What's the bones and the joints? That's the yang of, or that's the yin of yang, right? So you're starting to see how these things play together. So you see how this, um, how this plays together like this. So you're seeing where these fluids go. So that way, when you look at somebody and you know that they're having issues with their joints, you can understand, okay, the yin of yang, hmm, those are yin fluids. What's going on with the yin fluids? And you can go and you can look at that. What's going on with their digestion? Are they being able to be transported well enough? You know what I mean? Are they having an issue with the sinews? Okay, that's the yang of yang. Are they able to extract the gin fluids and move them correctly to the, to the skin and sinews to get them to be nourished enough. You know, so these aspects of understanding where you're applying and how you're applying um, your acupuncture is really important or Chinese medicine in general. Right. Um, let's see here. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. All right. So chapter 21 of the Su Wen, right. Fluid enters the stomach. It is then extracted as fluid essence, which is produced by the spleen. The spleen then separates the pure and turbid. Within the pure, there are the jin and the ya, which are transported to the lungs. The lungs in their function of regulating water passages distribute the purified fluids to the entire body via the channels and the collaterals, right? And finally to the five zang. And eventually the turbid and waste fluids are transported to the bladder. The metabolism of fluid and foods or food and fluids follows a certain order of seasons and is affected by the balance of yin and yang and the proper function of the zang fu. So one of the big things too, is to also look at what digestion, digestion as the cornerstone for a lot of your postnatal life issues. Um, and that's really important when you're looking at the um, levels of the channels, because you want to understand where these things are supposed to move out of the digestion at what level and where they're moving to try to figure out what channel system you're using. Can we see the yes slide? Sure. Is it there? That's it. That's the yes slide. All right. Tea. Thank you, Donna. Donna is a great tea buyer. She buys the best tea. All right. Let's see. Oh, bum, 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 bum. Let's see. Um, let's go on. All right. So Wei Chi. Let's go over Wei Chi a little bit. Right. And uh, for you guys who have done the Shang Hun class, these slides are all these ones here about the yeah and the Jin and the and the 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 um the way and the ying that we're about to go over. These are all from the Shang Hun Lun class that I just added into this one as a review, or for some of you guys, um, uh, uh, for some of you guys who have not um taken that class, you can go back and see that right. So, um, so the way chi is referred to in English as protective or defensive chi, right? The Huangdi Neijing describes it in many chapters. We know it is created from multiple sources. The turbid portion of the, the jin fluids, right? The stomach fluids, this wei jin, right? Um, is also 
the source of the yin qi, right? The idea of the shen yang, the kidney yang. This is one of the aspects of yuan qi, right? So kidney yang is an aspect of yuan qi. Um, uh, keep this in mind though, because the idea, the second character I wrote down for yuan qi here, and I went over this in the Shanghai Lun class, the yuan, that character for yuan is not in the Huangdi Neijing. So that's important. Um, uh, so that's important for you guys uh, to understand that. To understand the concept of how this began to evolve in latter dynasties, you have to take into consideration that Jing Qi and Shen or Jing Shui and Qi, right? You move from dense to more ethereal substance, right? And this is the idea too of going from Yuan to Ying to Wei, right? So the most dense is Yuan Qi, right? From an acupuncturist's point of view. Then there's Ying Qi and then there's Wei Qi, right? All right, so what does Wei Qi do? It moves on the surface of the body, right? It floats and moves in the exterior tissues of the body. So the Ling Shu chapter 76 discusses the passage of Wei Qi along the Yang channels externally, followed by internal circulation. As it moves internally, it moves through the smooth muscle. We'll go over this a lot more when we get, or we'll touch on it, I should say, in because a lot of this stuff is just being touched on so you can get a broad idea. Um, goes over the smooth muscle internally, as far as the idea of the Jing Jing, the sinew channels go, right? As they move internal, um, the yin sinews move internal at, at Ren 3, right? Zhong Ji, the uh, central pivot, and at Yuan Ye, here at gallbladder 22, right? So um, moves internally through the smooth muscle, through the gut, the intestines, the urinary bladder, right? These, this movement of Wei Qi into these areas is responsible for things like urination and defecation, right? and much of the autonomic nervous system function. That's Wei Qi, right? That's the understanding of Wei Qi that was understood before we even had a name for autonomic nervous function, right? So this in chapter 76, first describes the outside circulation of Wei Qi, followed by the internal circulation of Wei Qi as it moves into the chest, right? It moves into the chest along the leg Xiaoyin channel. What's the leg Xiaoyin channel? The kidney channel. Right. But you'll find out a lot of times, though, that things aren't always talked about as well. Today, we talk about a lot of the channels based on right, their Zongfu association. Oh, this is the kidney channel. But when you read the Huangdi Neijing, you'll see that a lot of times it's not a reference to the kidneys. It's a reference to it as its leg Xiaoyin channel or arm Taiyang channel, you know, the arm small intestine channel. But they don't call it the small intestine channel. They call it the arm Taiyang channel. And that kind of gets your mind to think about them, the channels, as their own individual entities in and amongst themselves, right? So that's really, um, that's really important. Uh, when the yang is exhausted or in yin, the yin receives the qi, right? The protective qi commences to enter into the yin, and it is constant in following the leg minor channel, the kidney channel, when it flows into the kidneys. From the kidneys, it flows into the heart. From the heart, it flows into the lungs. So you see this internal circulation. This happens at night, right? From the lungs, it flows into the liver, from the liver to the spleen, and from the spleen back to the kidneys, making one revolution. This is a description of the functioning and circulation of Wei Qi when you sleep at night, how it circulates internally, right? And why does it, it starts in the kidney and then it goes back to the kidney. Why does it do that? Because as you start to wake up in the morning, that Yang Qi ascends Dumai, moves into the Taiyang, right? The sinew channel and appears out Jingming bladder one. When you open your eyes, it gets activated, right? So this is his movement back out when you begin to stir in the morning. And when you begin to stir, we'll talk about this later on. As you get up, it first activates the leg Yang channels. Those are the first channels to be activated because those are what's going to help you get up and stand upright, right? So that's going to be that activation and circulation of Yang. So, um, uh, the primary form of chi, um, uh, this is the primary form of chi, wei chi, that's affected in the um, in the taiyang regions of the body and in the taiyang sinew channel that we'll get to to wake a person up in the morning and to move about in the day and to protect you from things like wind cold. Taiyang is a predominant channel for that um, when it comes to wei chi. So we also know that wei chi does what? It controls the opening and the closing of the pores. We talked about this a little bit before. Um, the Su Wen talks in chapter 42 about chills are often a result from the pores being kept open, right? So conversely, 
um, when the pores are closed, person becomes stuffy and feverish. They can't release things externally and you start to get chi stagnation under the surface, right? You get pathogen battling with Wei Qi, right? You get this inability to clear things out. So this is what this is talking about here. Um, all the body's yang comes from the upper jowl or cavity. The function of this yang is to warm the skin and regulate the pores, right? So this just goes on to explain the idea of, of Wei Qi and moving in the, and how it circulates through the surface of the body. Um, this is another one that talks about it too. We won't go over it, but you guys will have this in your notes when you get the notes. But again, if you guys have your Shang Lu notes, this is in the Shang Lu notes. This is directly from that. Um, this is just more of that, the understanding of Tai Yang. Um, we're not discussing uh, um, infectious disease though. We're discussing muscular pain. So, But you can still have musculoskeletal pain with an external invasion because you can get achy, right? Your joints get achy, you can get tight. So there are aspects of that that you'll see overlap in this. Um, so we talked about Wei Qi being related as a mood and a um, as this idea of a reflex, right? Uh, so keep in mind, this is automatic and reflexive, right? So this can also be the idea of allergies. Remember, and I'll talk about this later, but the idea you go into a place and you start to tear up, right? Because you're allergic to something or you start to sneeze. That's a Wei Qi reaction. All right. Ying Qi, right? Is referred to in English as constructive Qi or nourishing Qi. It comes from the stomach Jin fluids, right? It comes through the primary channels of the interior aspect of the body. So it's coming through the Ying level, right? Coming through the Jing Luo, right? So the yin chi is linked to conscious action, emotions, and sentiments based on thought. This is referred to as qing, right? This is an internal influence, right? They're rooted in thought, feelings rooted in thought. So often referred to as um, cognition and sentience in Buddhist texts. Um, so this talks about the idea of yo qing, right? This idea of sentience, sentient beings, things that can think about things. When you have an emotion in Chinese culture, even if it's an emotional outburst, it's something, um, you say, well, I couldn't control it. It was a passion. The idea though, is that you could, because the cognitive, um, understanding and, uh, digestion of that, and then your emotional outbursts, whatever happened is still under the domain of cognitive conscious reaction, right. Or action. So that would be the idea in, in, uh, Chinese culture. So the emotions and thoughts have a target based on circumstances and experiences that the person consciously even if not overtly obvious, can define through reasoning, right? So the idea of yin qi versus wei qi, we're not going to go over this because we'll go over this more. We're not going to read this because we'll have more of this as we go through. But this is a chapter from the Ling Shu, um, chapter 18, and this talks more about it. You guys can uh, read through this when you have the notes. All right. Yuan qi, right? The reason why I'm going over a lot of these citations is just so you see where I'm coming from. Because a lot of times um, uh, when we learn this and, and Jeffrey teaches a lot of things very fast, um, he'll refer to chapters within the classics, but it'll be kind of a broad reference, right? And so what I'm trying to do is um, give people uh, some examples of, of quotes from that. So if they, when they go study with him, they'll have that as a basis. So they'll understand and they'll be able to keep up with him. Um, hopefully, uh, so, so you're in Qi, right? The terms are not present within the Huangdi Di the, the second term, right? Um, or, or this idea of Yuan Qi. Um, so the concept is talked about, um, as Gen Qi or true Qi, right? Is often referred to as Qi that comes from heaven. This is the more modern idea of what Yuan Qi is, the source Qi that's conferred upon you from heaven upon conception, right? Um, and it unites with Gu Qi to fill the body. So Gen Qi is referred to as upright or correct Qi. I'm sorry, right Qi or correct Qi, not upright. That would be Zheng Qi, um, right Qi or correct Qi. And is also um, referred to as heart Qi in, in uh, the Su Wen chapter uh, 33. So it says in the Ling Shu chapter 75, it says uh, the genuine Qi in which it is received from heaven and the valleys are forth with filled up with the chi of the body. Um, so this is referring to the idea of the gen chi, the genuine chi that comes down, right? Um, this goes, this is another chapter on the idea of the genuine chi. The genuine chi 
um, is that which is received from heaven and is, fills up the body, right? The primary chi and the primal seasons winds, they follow the different quadrants. It just goes on to explain where these different chis, how they affect the body. But this is, again, to give you just a basic understanding of there's different chi at different levels. This is why with the channel systems, we need a different depth. This is why just treating with the primaries is not really focused on the different levels. Somebody can go their whole life and treat with the primaries, but that is not that does not have um, the same effect as treating all of the channel in all the different depths, right? So the Lomai really focus on the yin chi and they focus on the blood vessels and the movement of the yin in the blood through the yin level. The primaries don't specifically focus on that. They focus on that which connects the yin and the way so they can move back and forth. But if you're having a yin level issue or a way level issue, you know, musculoskeletal issue, then to directly focus on that musculoskeletal issue would be to use the sinew channels, right? The jing jing, that's really important. Um, all right. So this idea of your and chi, right? So this idea of thought, inborn vigor, vitality. Mm. So the layer wise, sometimes some of you may have learned this as being, as being associated with these trinities, right? So if wei is on the surface, ying is in the middle and yuan is the deepest layer. Then the idea of tian ren di, right? Heaven, man, and earth. So heaven is the surface, right? That's the external layer that's the way layer right ren is the idea of the middle layer that's the ying chi and then d is the earth so some people have seen these these needling depths referred to as needle to the heavenly layer needle to the man layer needle to the earth layer this is the idea of needling to the way layer heaven is way right needle to the ying layer um man is ying and then needle to the deep layer earth where things are you know stored and you know structure is deep and that's the yuan layer right the constitutional level. So we've got this idea here. All right. So I did not write the opinion for this. Oh, wow. On the top of the page, that must have been because I wrote this at two in the morning. I'm sorry. Um, so the Qi Jing Ba Mai is the eight extraordinary vessels. Um, I'm trying to write the opinion at the top of every page for when I write that channel. And I guess I missed it for this one. Um, so the level of the Yuan Qi is where the influence of, this is the level of Yuan Qi where both the influence of ancestral inheritance and astrological influence takes place. This is where you derive the Qi for the level of the kidneys, right? And the Jing. And the eight extraordinaries work on the level of Yuan Qi running through the bone and the marrow. This is the level of parental inheritance, right? So this affects morphology which can be used for morphological diagnosis. So when you have somebody who comes in and you do physiognomy, you do palmistry, face reading, this is that level. This is the understanding of the effect of parental inheritance of Jing at the level of the eight extras, at the level of Yuan Qi, right? The other thing that affects the eight extras and Yuan Qi is the idea of cosmic influence. This is the Yuan Qi from the universe, right? So at the time of conception, this can affect the curriculum. What's the weather outside, right? So this is like a big thing. You know, there's a lot of times in Asian culture, Japanese cultures can sometimes be strong about this. You know, there's a type of uh, weather that you want to be conceived under that's auspicious, that, you know, confers, you know, uh, better yuan chi on a child. Um, and so this idea here, the treatment of Cosmic influences is also done in acupuncture. And this is based on the lingue bafa, right? The magic tortoise. Some of you guys have seen this um, or do this practice, this style of acupuncture. So this is the idea of affecting cosmic influences. So treating the eight extraordinary vessels, the qi jing ba mai, is a practice of treating what? Ancestral influences and cosmic influences that come from conception, from the earliest point where you were incarnated into this life, right? So that's why these channels would be used. Um, these channels, like I said, evolve to deal with environmental changes and disease. Within the, um, within the Yuan level, we also have, the reason I wrote this, we also have the idea of the curious organs, right? The Qi Hong Zhi Fu, right? Six curious organs are involved in this, right? So you have the Gu, the bone, right? The Bao, 
The bao is the idea loosely of the genitals, but really what it means is the zugong in the females, zugong is the uterus, right? In the males, it's the dantian, right? So this is the idea of the bao in the lower area. So then you have another of the uh, curious organs is the mai, the blood vessels, right? And then the other one is the dan, the gallbladder, the sui, the marrow, and the now the brain, right? So it's important to know these things and where you're treating, because if you're going to be you're going to be treating curious organ issues. You're going to use what? The eight extraordinaries, right? This is how you're going to treat it. So understanding where these, so somebody's got an issue with their brain, you know, or the brain and the marrow, you know, uh, um, uh, um, you know, issue a congenital issue that affects the brain and the marrow. You'd be treating what? The eight extraordinary vessels using channel theory, right? So this is important to understand where this goes and how this moves. So young curious organs associate with physical structure. So again, the idea of the yang of yang, right? The yin of yin, right? And these ideas of understanding the correspondences is really important. So yang curious organs would associate with physical structure. So yang curious organs are what? That create structure are the bone, right? Gu, right? Um, are the idea of the bao, right? The genitals, because you can see that physical structure appear in the outside because it's involved in with the, what they call the zong jin, the ancestral sinews, the external um, expression of the genitals, right? To allow you to reproduce. And then the my, the blood vessels, right? Because we can see that in our skin. We can see how that, you know, produces externally. But then the yin curious organs, right? Associate with internal structure. Things that you don't really see as much, right? We don't see gallbladders generally, unless we're going to do surgery. You don't really see the, the physical gallbladder on the outside of the body, right? We don't see marrow. We see the effects of the marrow. We can see the bone shape through the skin, but we don't see the marrow in the brain. We don't see the marrow in the, in the bone, right? We can't see that, right? Um, and then the brain, the brain, we don't see either, right? That's covered in bone. So these are the yin internal aspects of the curious organs. Um, so then the yeah fluids, right? The yeah fluids go to nourish aspects of the, the marrow, right? The brain and the bone, right? And also the spine, right? So the ye does this. The blood go to aspect, uh, go to nourish the as the ex, uh, a lot of the external aspects, the the blood vessels, right, the uterus, right, and in this case also it goes to nourish the gallbladder. Why does it nourish the gallbladder? It nourishes the gallbladder because it's also a zong organ, so it still exists partially in the ying level. So that's why you see that there. All right. So when you have the curious organs, um, uh. They tend to evolve first, which is really interesting among species. So with the Zhang Fu, they don't really alter too much, right? You find similar structures in all of these things. So a heart is a heart, a lung is a lung. They might be slightly different depending like an aquatic animal, you know, the, the, the gills of the fish, but like most or uh, most animals that live on land are going to have similar structured lungs. You know, many of them have similar structured hearts, but ironically enough, the curious organs are what evolve considerably brains, right? Brains evolve considerably, right? Um, marrow evolves considerably because then it creates the bones differently for upright posture and different things to react to what their environment, right? So an interesting thing that I found when um, putting together this class, because I looked up some of these curious organs to see, because I had a funny feeling, the gallbladder is actually varies in greatly among vertebrates. It's in most vertebrate animals, but it's actually one of the most varying organs, which is fascinating to me among vertebrates. It's much, and there are some mammals that don't even have a gallbladder. Um, so it follows in line with the idea of the curious organs being that which differentiates evolution, right? Gallbladder. So mammals such as a deer, rats, um, mice have a gallbladder, but rats don't. Isn't that interesting? Certain species of horses, some species of birds, um, uh, laminoids are, are like a llama species. I found out, uh, lamprey and all invertebrates do not have gallbladders. So it shows that the evolutionary aspects of the curious organs definitely change across species. Right. And this is seen in the uh, development of those curious organs. Um, all right. Cutaneous vessels. Now we're going to get on to a little more of the explanation of the channels. Let's see. All right. So um, we will be not doing a lot with treating the cutaneous vessels because we're dealing with musculoskeletal pain and the pain that occurs in musculoskeletal pain generally starts at the uh, CU channels. So 
we're going to be focusing mostly on that on the CU channel aspect of things um, and deeper from that. So we'll go over a bit of the cutaneous vessels a little more, but we're not gonna go in, um, in sort of treatment methods on it because that's not where musculoskeletal pain uh, resides. And generally treating, like I said before, treating cutaneous vessels generally comes through treating the um, idea of the uh, uh, sinews or the divergence in a specific way because they come up to the surface of the body. Um, so only dealing, uh, the cutaneous vessels only deal with Wei Qi, only deals with it as it moves out, but it does not deal with any Wei Qi moving back inwards, right? As do the sinew channels. The sinew channels help to cycle. They cycle things in, they cycle things are out, they cycle things back in, right? The yang sinews send Wei Qi outwards, the yin sinews bring things back in, right? Not the cutaneous vessels. The lungs move things to the cutaneous vessels, and then they release outwards through the nourishment of the cutaneous vessels, but they do not themselves cycle things back in. So due to the circulation of qi, the people, right? The cutaneous vessels um, from the sinews and the divergence, most cutaneous vessel issues are particularly treated, like I said, via these types of channels, right? So this is, um, uh, so this is what we'll see mostly in this class. So here is a chart for uh, cutaneous vessels. Um, this will be related to more when we get into the divergence, particularly because there are zones of the cutaneous vessels that relate to where certain divergence release. And I've, I have another chart that I put together. Last night, I, I actually drew out on my computer um, a lot of the secondary uh, vessel trajectories so that you guys can see them and you guys can have them. And uh, so you'll see that. When we get to divergence, you'll see how the uh, people relate there to um, to the divergence to release things from the deep level outwards. All right, so let's get started with our first major channel group here. So the idea of the sinew channels. So the jinjing, right? So the sinew channels. Are a, large ex, are a large external manifestations of the body. They're the largest ones. We see them, right? We see our musculature externally. We don't see, I can't see my spleen externally, right? I can't see my, my stomach externally, unless it's really bloated, right? I can't see my intestines, you know, externally. Um, I can't see my heart externally, but I can see my sinew channels. I can see, you can see muscles when they contract and they expand. You can see all these things, right? You can see muscles flex. I can't see my heart beating up you know, through my chest, unless I'm really, really, really wound up, you know, through some sort of excitement, right. Um, or, you know, scared or really, uh, um, uh, taxed through exercise, right. Um, or you have a major, major issue. Those would be the only things where you see that kind of externally moving, but the sinew channels, you can see externally, right. External manifestation of the body. They manipulate the environment, right. Um, uh, somebody asked, are we breaking at 11th? Somebody asked, are we breaking at 11? Okay, we will break at 11. So, all right. So, uh, so this idea of the, the CU channels are the external manifestation to manipulate the environment. Some people would say, there are some beliefs that say that the CU channels are actually the external manifestation of the Jing Luo, right? The primary channels. There's a, um, there's a theory that says that if the primary channels connect your internal and external, then the internal manifestation is the low mai. The external manifestation is the 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 jing jing, the sinew channels. And we'll we'll repeat this over and over so that you can remember this. Um, so philosophically, if the jing luo represent your life, and anatomically they represent the flesh connecting the low mai, the jing jing, and even the pibu, right? The the cutaneous vessels. Um, the consciousness within the Jing Luo can, through active awareness, interact with the outside and utilize the Jin Jing, the sinew channels, to accomplish what you consciously want to do. Right. So this is this idea where the uh, where the sinew channels are the external manifestation of the Jing Luo. Right. Understanding that Wei Qi is unconscious action reaction. And the yin qi is often associated with the idea of consciously mentally stimulated action. The difference to, between the two can be seen in the reactions that occur through unconscious reaction, right? 
I talked about tearing earlier because you have an allergy or conscious reaction, watching a movie and tearing up due to emotion, right? That is, you see a movie, it's sad, you cry, right? But the other one is you're not like, oh, oh I, yeah, I'm feeling a reaction. It's an allergy. We should uh, cry now. You don't consciously think that it just happens, right? So that's the idea. Um, that's the idea there be, between the idea of, of Wei Qi, right? Reflexively causing you to tear and Ying Qi, the conscious action of that. So there was a question before of, um, of the idea of treating the emotions and, um, uh, and, and the idea here would be you would be treating them through the ying level and ying qi, right? Because in Chinese medicine and in Chinese culture, the idea of an emotion, you can say it's reflexive, but there's still a conscious action behind it. It's rooted in some sort of consciousness. If you watch a sad movie with an infant, you know, they're not necessarily going to cry because they can't, can't even consciously conceptualize what's happening. They just stare at a screen of colors, right? You've learned to consciously conceptualize it. But reflexively, if you all, both go into a place you're both sneezing, right? Say you go into a place with an allergy, you're sneezing, the infant sneezing. The infant didn't have to learn how to sneeze. It's automatically reflexive. It just happens, right? Um, so that's where the difference between, say, the idea of Wei Qi being reflexive and Ying Qi. Um, so, uh, so that's the idea and why Ying Qi uh, and the idea of tearing due to emotions is a conscious action versus uh, tearing due to allergies is an unconscious action, right? All right, let's see. Um, so the Jinjing, the sinew channels are the most exterior expression of the, I talked about this, of the internal body. Through them flows the Wei Qi as it protects the body in the Wei level, right? So it's the most exterior level. It moves towards the outside, the skin, the pi, right? And the Jin, the sinews. Via the Yang, Jinjing, via the Yang sinew channels, right? So the arm Yang channels unite we call these Hui, right? To unite at the area of Ben Shen, gallbladder 13 and Toe, stomach eight. So this is really an area you'll see in some books, they'll say gallbladder 13. You'll see other ones say stomach eight. It's a general area. Cause remember, so you channels are, we'll talk about this. They're broad. They're not small vessels. They're, they're fairly broad. So a lot of these are just general areas, right? So the arms to you channels unite at the area of gallbladder 13 and stomach eight. Uh, the leg arm channels unite at the cheek, small intestine 18. Some say stomach three, right? So again, area, right? Area on the face where you can feel binding, where you could feel this uniting, right? The position of the sinew confluent points is due to external movement of Wei Qi, activated first by opening the eyes, right? This idea of opening the eyes upon waking and then the idea of moving out into the world. So it moves from bladder one, the eyes open to small intestine 18. And it starts to activate the yang leg channels to be able to stand up. And as you start to stand up and move, you start to use your arms to do things through the day. You start consciously doing things right. And this, this idea of having this uniting point here by the head is reflexive of the idea that you use your arms, right? You're using them cognitively to do things, even though it's a, it's a yin aspect, still the muscles are working um, reflexively to, to do a yin, to accomplish like yin, yin expressions of things, right? So this is this idea here. Uh, all right. Um, it ten, so then what happens is we have the yin sinews, right? So we have this idea that these, uh, uh, the Wei Qi tends to move up to the chest in the area of the genitals via the yin sinew channels. The arm yin channels unite with gallbladder 22 and home in on in the chest. The chest is what? The idea of Dan Zhong, right? Ren 17. They move into gallbladder 22. They unite here. This is a major point because this is also a major point with divergent channels, right? So this is kind of an idea of where the actual trajectories of the sinews can unite with divergence and then move things inwards to the body or move things into the divergent channels. Um, but so that's why gallbladder 22, yin yi is really important. But the idea is it moves and it's able to home these things into the chest. This is important at night. So when you're going to sleep at night, you move the Wei Qi internally because this moves into the pericardium ultimately, 
to protect your heart while you're sleeping, right? This idea of protecting while you're sleeping, this idea of protecting you from nightmares, you know, things like that, that can, so you don't have a, a heart attack while you're sleeping, right? This is this idea. Um, so the leg sinews, right? The Zhu Yin Jin, they unite in the lower burner at Ren 3, Zhong Ji, right? And move into the abdomen and the lower burner. Right. So that's what's happening here. So they move into the lower burner and the abdomen. We talked about the circulation before. We'll go over it again um, in a bit. Chapter five of the Ling Shu refers to the channel starting at the Jingwell points. Right. So this is an interesting chapter because it talks, doesn't talk about the channels as a continuum from necessarily one channel to another to another. It talks about them all coming in from their Jingwell points. And they talk, this is a, the channel on the, what they call roots and terminations. And the idea here on roots and terminations is that you come in from the external to the internal, up into the chest, up into the head, right? So the yang channels, the yang sinew channels all go up into the head. Now, so that's really easy to remember. So all the yang sinews, whether they're the legs, they come up to some small intestine 18 area, right? Stomach three, or the arms, they come up here to Ben Shen, gallbladder 13, or Toei, stomach eight. They're coming up into the head, right? The yang rises higher. Really easy way to remember it, right? The yin channels, they rise up into the leg yin channels, rise up into the chest and the abdomen, right? So the leg channels for the yin rise up to zhong ji, ren three, and the arms come into yin yi, right? Um, gallbladder 22. So this is the idea of, so in this chapter, they discuss the idea of functioning of like physiology functioning correctly. And as long as physiology functions correctly, things move together in this continuum, right? But once things start to break down, they talk about how things stop functioning well and things get fractured and fragmented and don't, you know, move well together, right? So this is unlike, and, and the, but the way they describe these channels one by one is always is from the Jing Wells in, it's different than most other um, uh, chapter. So this is a suggestion. This is referring to the idea and the movement of Wei Qi, right? And the idea of the movement of, of the sinews. It gives it, us a clue into the idea of the sinew channels. All right. So here is the chapter, right? Um, we're, uh, so it says the major yang makes the gates, right? That's Tai Yang, right? The bright yang, Yang Ming, right? Makes the inner door. And the minor yang, Xiao Yang, makes the pivots. You know, this is something we kind of learn in school, right? Breaking the gate, though, will cause the flow of disease to the flesh and joints. You get musculoskeletal pain, right? And cruel disease will begin. Because cruel disease will begin, one must treat major yang, tai yang, and see if there is an, excuse, uh, is there is an excess of deficiency. This flow will weaken and emaciate the skin and the flesh. So we know that the external invasion affects the external, affects the way level, right? Um. And it even goes down to the flesh, the, the yin level, right? Breaking the inner door will result in the weakness, in weakness because the qi is unable to stop and rest. Thus, for weakness, treat yang ming to boost qi, right? Yang ming is the most internal yang. Yang ming is really the beginning of the internalization of pathology. That's why we have so much heat there. So if there is weakness, you want to tonify that internalization of yang that's Yang Ming. By seeing if there is excess or weakness, right? Without stop or rest, the genuine chi is delayed and detained while evil chi takes residence. When the pivot is broken and the bones are shaken, it is not possible to even be balanced on the ground. Thus, when the bones are shaken, treat minor yang, xiao yang. By seeing this, if there is excess or deficiency, minor yang, gallbladder, right? If you look at gallbladder channel, the idea of the um, effect of the gallbladder channel on the bones um, is seen. You can see the idea of, we talked about how the marrow builds the bones, right? The influential point of marrow sits on the gallbladder channel, right? So these ideas of affecting the bones themselves, if the bone, if shaken bones cause joints to be difficult to bend, then discuss the bone shaking and the reasons for shaking and thoroughly examine that point as its roots. So this is giving you an idea that, Based on the channels, as pathology moves in, you can start to see musculoskeletal pain, musculoskeletal dysfunction. So that's the point with this, um, with this, with the reason why I quoted this, so you guys can see this for the sinew channels here.
Um, it's 11 o'clock. We should take a quick break and we will get back to it. 